Hi everyone, it's Q&A time. I'm going to answer some of your questions from the comments section on my YouTube channel. And I'm just picking out the questions that I think could do with a more involved answer. They're mostly about camera gear, lenses and things like that. So let's get stuck into it. So the first question is thinking of going for two 5D Mark IIs instead of one 5D Mark II and one Canon R5. So my response to this, I think you should go for the R5 and the 5D Mark II as a combination together. Let me just explain a little bit why. If you're actually shooting weddings, not a wedding, not just one, like a friend's wedding or something, this then becomes work. Let me tell you, at the point when photography becomes work, things that make your life significantly easier matter. In certain genres, like studio portrait photography, things like autofocus are not massively important because if you're shooting at like f2.8, f4, in, and the subject's hardly moving, then the focus is gonna be really easy for the camera. But I've shot loads and loads of weddings, like nearly 400 weddings, something in that range. And focus is hugely important because if you're fighting to get focus all the time and that's your job, then you are willing to pay more money to make your life easier. You see, these things are then investments. This is where I think I need to clarify some things on this channel a little bit. If you're a working professional, you will have an idea of what you need once you start doing that job. You see, there's certain jobs that I will do, small commercial jobs, for example, where the camera I'm using, a DSLR is absolutely fine for that and makes no difference. But there's times when I need maybe video or the autofocus makes a big difference. And if I was going to be a working wedding photographer, that's how I'm paying the bills. Then an autofocus system is like the number one thing that I want to have improved. And I'll give you some examples of where things like this changed. So back in the day when the 5D Mark II was the thing that wedding photographers were all using, then what happened was Nikon came along and we had focusing systems that worked where you could use all the outer focus points as well and everyone switched. I don't know if you remember that time period, but wow, like everyone was dumping Canon and switching over to Nikon simply for the autofocus system. And Canon had to respond with the 5D Mark III and beef up the autofocus system. So imagine you're actually photographing a wedding and the bride's coming down the aisle and the light condition's really low. Wouldn't it be really nice to always know that your camera is just effortlessly hitting focus on every single shot versus that little as it's trying to focus on the 5D Mark II, which can easily happen in lower light conditions. It can really struggle. And, and then constantly having scenario after scenario with that. What you're dealing with in weddings is often bad lighting conditions, low lighting conditions. So it's bad low lights with moving subjects that are not necessarily fast, but potentially erratic uh, and coming in and out of your focus plane all the time. They're not trying to take you into account, the people that you're photographing, because it's reportage, you're catching moments as they happen, they're not taking into account where you are, they don't really care where you are, they're not paying any attention to that. So your focus system has to be able to hit. If you're always stuck with the centre focus point, that's exactly the perfect condition under which the limitations of that focusing system, centre point only, and not particularly good at it, become really apparent. It's like the perfect worst case scenario for a camera like the 5D Mark II. Now, if you're doing outdoor weddings and things, then this is a different story. And I know that there's fabulous work shot on the 5D Mark II, and I've shot weddings on the 5D Mark II as well. It's just, from that experience, I'm telling you, I know how much of a difference autofocus makes. If I can have one feature on a camera for wedding photography that is good, it's going to be the autofocus, because everything else is kind of like, it's the focus system that you need for weddings. And if you're becoming a working photographer, if you can afford something like the R5, I would pounce on that and get the benefits of that focus system because this is your job. Make your life easier with that if you can do it. If it's outside of your price range, I would probably go for something like a 5D Mark III for weddings, just for the better focusing system. You know what I mean? I'd probably go for another option you could do is two 5D Mark III's and you'd be happy with that because the focusing system is, is just so much better on it. Because I know the counter argument is, ah, oh, but everyone was shooting 5D Mark II's, you know, for wedding photography. Yes, they were. And everyone was complaining about the focusing system because I know because I was one of them and my friends were doing it and the people that I knew that were working photographers, we were doing the same thing. Everyone was moaning and moaning and moaning about the 5D Mark II focusing system for wedding photography, <laughs> let me be specific, because it was fine for pretty much everything else that we did.
so it wasn't a problem. Hi Martin, is there a particular Canon APS-C, that's a crop sensor camera, that you would recommend? Yeah, there is actually. And it took me a while to come around to this because I didn't keep the camera for a very long time, maybe six months. The reason that I recommend it to people now is because in hindsight, I don't think I appreciated just quite how good it was. And I kind of regret that. And that's the Canon 80D. I don't have extensive experience with the crop sensor camera. So I take this like lightly, really. Um, the only other one is the 40D, but if you want something that's got sort of more modern features, modern, auto, modern autofocus and things like that, really nice screen on the back of it. I tell you guys now, all of you, if you want a camera that can get a lot of things done, the 80D is kind of like a bit of a hidden gem, I think actually, very, very, very good camera. Hi Martin, would you please comment about exposure bracketing? I think I understand it in principle, but it sounds like way too much work and planning for little return compared to getting the right exposure from the start. When you bracket your exposures, you're taking brightness values that are brighter in the middle and darker, and then you're combining them into one file. And the reason that people are doing this is not because they can't get the right exposure to start with. This is one of these things that keeps coming up again and again and again. It's that there's this sort of feeling that, well, if you just get it right in camera, and I hate this saying because I don't think people understand about how rubbish cameras are. I know that sounds harsh, but they're really rubbish. They don't have anything like what we have as eyes. They're just, they're nowhere close to it. So cameras can't see details in the highlights and shadows very well at the same time. So there are a lot of high contrast scenes that you can be in, where the camera, if you try to take one exposure that exposes for the whole scene, it can't actually do it because something's gonna be really bright. And if you try to make sure that that doesn't clip, the dark areas will clip because they're too dark. And it's the same the other way around. And this sort of idea that, oh, but the perfect exposure is right in the middle. No, it's not. There is no perfect exposure for a scene like that. Everything is going to be a compromise. You're going to lose something. So if you do the middle exposure, you're gonna lose both the highlights and the shadow areas. Both ends of your histogram will clip and you'll have white areas in the picture and completely black areas in the picture as well. You can have scenes that are high contrast enough that happens. Now this isn't every scene. This only happens when you have really dark, dark areas and really bright, bright areas. So there is no correct single exposure. What we have to do is we have to find a way to increase the exposure range of our image that we can expose for more highlights and more shadows. Like let's say this is our middle exposure. Then what we're doing is we're bumping up our highlight region and then we're bumping up our shadow region to expand the dynamic range of the picture. And we're doing that by taking three pictures. So one shot exposing for the highlights, one for the shadows and one in the middle combined into one picture that has lots of dynamic range, lots of details in the highlights and lots of details in the shadows. That's the reason why we have to do that. So there is no kind of, if we just expose properly in certain scenes, that's not possible. Okay, so this question is about the 5D Mark I. And Georgie says, as it doesn't have auto ISO, so the 5D Mark I doesn't have auto ISO. Does setting it to aperture priority help the camera automatically expose brightness if ISO is roughly in the right place? Yeah, that's kind of it. So what, what you do is you, you kind of have to pick a working range. And this is pretty much the same in manual mode so when I'm at, let's say, f2.8, I'm using a lens that's stuck at f2.8, I'm leaving it there, and I'm in aperture priority. When I set my ISO, it needs to be high enough that the camera can go darker and lighter. So usually what that will look like is that I've set my ISO about two stops higher, or one stop higher at least, than it kind of needs to be for my average exposure for the scene. This means that Certain times when it needs to go darker, it can do it. And then if it needs to go lighter, it can do it. So my shutter speed can move around without being in a dangerous range. I don't want to let my shutter speed get down to like a tenth of a second or something. I want to have an ISO that's high enough that my likely lowest shutter speed would be like one one twenty fifth of a second or something like that, whatever I deem to be the lowest acceptable shutter speed for the scene and the pictures that I'm taking. If you were choosing between the Canon RP and an older Nikon D750, which would you recommend for printing landscape and travel photography? My answer to that is, can you stretch to an EOS R? 
I think for like the travel stuff and landscape stuff, mirrorless is nice to use if you're the type of photographer that's shooting handheld a lot and you want to get those kind of different angles. I think for, for doing travel stuff in particular, um, being able to like, have the camera in your hand and, and kind of see at different angles with a tilt screen is that's game changing. You know, like earlier in the video, I was talking about how autofocus is pretty much everything for wedding photography. I think that for the travel stuff, maybe not so much landscapes. Yeah, kind of, but like more for travel stuff. I think the tilt screen, that's the game changer for that. I think the with with focus it works. So I know the D750 has got a tilt screen. It doesn't have working autofocus on that tilt square. It has contrast detect, but we know what that's like. Check out the links in the description down below. Drop me a comment and if you've got any questions for the next Q&A. I hope you enjoyed that video. I'll see you again in the next one. Take care. Bye-bye.